picked up while re-entering the atmosphere. We heard a large boom, and then that was followed by a second boom. Wreckage scattered over a wide area as America mourns the loss of seven astronauts. The Columbia's lost. There are no survivors. Good evening. The history of man's efforts to reach for the stars has been marked by spectacular triumph and heartbreaking tragedy. Today was one of those tragedies. The shuttle Columbia was high over Texas and not far from home in Florida when it disintegrated, claiming the lives of seven astronauts in the worst accident since the Challenger disaster in 1986. There is intense speculation already about the cause, with most centering on a piece of insulating material which broke off and hit one of the wings when the mission began. We begin our coverage with Michael Usher live from the Kennedy Space Center. Well, Mark, quite a few hours on now. The men and women here at NASA are still numb, but they're working through the night, analyzing all that data and trying to piece together what will be a very complicated jigsaw to try and find the technical answer to this tragedy. Americans looked to the heavens and saw a little bit of hell. The oldest of the space shuttles, Columbia, burning and breaking up at 20,000 kilometers an hour, 18 times the speed of sound. Absolutely no hope for the seven crew on board. A boom that just shook the house. It literally rattled the glass in the house. It was just an unbelievable sound. What began as a single shooting star was soon rupturing into many flaming pieces. As I looked at that, I could hear the sound like thunder. As people witnessed Columbia's end, 60 kilometers up in the sky, reality was emerging slowly at mission control. Continuing to stand by for communications from Columbia. It was just after 9 o'clock in the morning here. Communications lost 16 minutes before the shuttle was due to land at Cape Canaveral. The first sign of trouble when data stopped streaming in from heat sensors on the left wing and landing gear. This was the final link with the commander. Columbia, Houston, we see your tire pressure messages and we did not copy your last. Roger, uh, With sinking hearts, they kept trying to raise the crew. Columbia, Houston, UHF comm check. As the truth became clear, President Bush was rushed to the White House from his Camp David retreat to give his country the terrible news. The Columbia's lost. There are no survivors. He paid tribute to the crew. Colonel Rick Husband, Lieutenant Colonel Michael Anderson, Commander Laurel Clark, Captain David Brown, Commander William McCool, Dr. Kultna Shavla, and Ilan Ramon, a colonel in the Israeli Air Force. In a space program which had begun to seem routine, the relatives had been taken to the Cape to view the arrival of the Columbia and their loved ones. When it became clear that no one was coming home, they were quietly driven away to a private briefing room. Across a 300-kilometer arc of countryside through Texas and Louisiana, there have been at least 2,000 reports of fallen debris. It set fire to grassland. Also the roof of a suburban home, another piece smashed through the ceiling of a house. Suddenly things started raining down out of the sky. And they were just, it was sound like uh, a boomerang whizzing through the air. Out in the open, large spheres landed one of them loaded into the back of a truck despite warnings they could be dangerous. Most upsetting, a scorched space helmet and incredibly, a flight mission patch perhaps from someone's uniform. I almost stepped on what I thought was a piece of trash and when I looked down even closer I noticed it was a patch. It was a flight mission patch. The mission leaders then had the wrenching task of facing the country to discuss this loss to what they regard as their NASA family. We lost the data, and that's when we be clearly begin to know that we had a bad day. The space shuttle is a breathtaking symbol of America's wealth and technology, paving the way to man's future in space. All of us are suddenly reminded of the vast dangers of this great frontier and the bravery of the Columbia 7. Because of their courage and daring and idealism, we will miss them all the more. 
now as NASA is literally picking up the pieces of all those bits of debris. It's also beginning to download the mountains of data it has stored on its computers tracing the final moments of the shuttle voyage. NASA scientists will also look at their early investigation into that piece of foam that uh, fell off on launch. As one scientist said today, well perhaps we just missed something. Perhaps we're about to learn something new altogether, Mark. Michael, what about those reports that the debris could be toxic? Well, they're very true. NASA said today that people in Texas should really not go near any of those bits of debris because of all the fluids and fuels used on board the shuttle during flight that they could well be toxic and prove cancerous down the track, so not to go near them. Michael, how is America coping with this tragedy coming on top of recent events? Well, Mark, it certainly dredged up a lot of very terrible, shocking memories from the Challenger disaster 16 or 17 years ago. But I think it's also fair to say Americans in these times are fairly toughened by tragedy. And there was a fairly practical view out there today that as sad as this is, as tragic as it is, it is still a great big rocket, this shuttle, and it is very volatile and bad things can happen as they have. Mark. Michael Usher there reporting from the Kennedy Space Centre. We now go to Robert Penfold in Los Angeles. And Robert, as we've mentioned, this was the oldest of the shuttles. Is it possible that contributed to the disaster? Well, Mark, while Columbia, as you point out, is the oldest shuttle, uh, NASA wouldn't really ever contemplate allowing it to fly unless they thought it was 100% safe. It's had several overhauls, and NASA even considered putting it out to pasture a couple of years ago. But really, the investigation is, uh, it, well, it's just beginning. It's a huge job, and it's going to take some time. In the 42 years of manned spaceflight, NASA has never had a serious accident during re-entry and landing. Then came today, and the worry at NASA that just perhaps the disaster may have been caused by a problem they already knew about. And lift off. On launch day, the 16th of January, a piece of insulation foam on an external fuel tank broke off during liftoff and struck the leading edge of the shuttle's left wing. What they're going to be looking at is the question of whether there was damage to the thermal protection system, the tiles uh, on uh, the shuttle, possibly at liftoff that might have contributed uh, to a failure of the heat shield and uh, loss of control. The shuttle manager, Ron Dittmore, was forthright about the problem today. He conceded that the first signs of trouble were the sensors in that left wing. He said that while in space they'd studied the situation, and considered it would not present a safety concern. There was another problem too, because this was a scientific trip, no one on board was trained up to do a spacewalk, even if repairs were warranted. As we look at that now in hindsight, uh, that impact was on the left wing, um, and certainly we have all the indications that Milt talked to you about were on the left wing. We can't discount, discount that there might be a connection. Four of the seven astronauts were on their first shuttle flight, and all but one were married, and they leave behind their partners and 12 children. Laurel Clark, mother of an eight-year-old boy, was the doctor on board. We're incredibly lucky to be able to be working where we are, up above the Earth. Colonel Michael Anderson was in charge of the mission's science experiments and admitted he was nervous about the always dicey flight home. On this flight entry, I'm just going to sit down in my seat and uh, hopefully reflect on 16 days on orbit that we've had and just anxious to get back to be happy to have the flight uh, behind us. Shuttle Commander Rick Husband, a father of two on his second shuttle mission, while pilot Willie McCool was married with three sons. Uh, especially the views, uh, they're just beyond all imagination. Red, <laughs> orange, yellow to white. All in about 15 seconds, I saw my first sunrise across the tail of the orbiter. Mission specialist Kalpana Chalwa was born in India, came to America and realized a dream of going into space. The presence on board of Israeli Air Force fighter pilot Ilan Ramon was a great source of pride for the Israelis. He fought in the Yom Kippur War and flew missions destroying one of Iraq's part-built nuclear reactors. Today's loss brought back memories of the previous shuttle catastrophe in January 1986. Less than a week ago, NASA held a memorial service to remember the seven crew members lost just on 17 years ago. The disaster also creates huge problems for the continued use of the International Space Station and the three people still up there. They can and occasionally do use Russian space capsules as transport vehicles, but the shuttle and its large carrying capacity is the main workhorse. 
After the 1986 Challenger disaster, it was over two and a half years before the shuttles were cleared to fly again. And Robert, you've mentioned the space station. What of the astronauts still up there? Well, Mark, they were due to be picked up by another shuttle uh, early in March, but that won't happen now because all the shuttles have been grounded. If there is a problem, they can still get back to Earth using a Russian capsule, but they'll stay there for the time being, and they have enough food and supplies to last them until about June. And Robert, what now for the families of the seven Columbia astronauts? Well, Mark, tonight they are being taken from Florida to the Johnson Space Centre in Houston, Texas. Counselling is being provided, as you can imagine. And very probably later this week, the President will join them in Houston for a memorial service. Mark? Robert, thank you. Prime Minister Howard today expressed his sympathy to those affected by the disaster, which includes a group of Australian students. They had been involved with a scientific experiment on board the shuttle. One had even travelled to Cape Canaveral to witness the landing. Mission and lift off of space like missions before it, the Columbia's 16-day odyssey involved countries from all over the world, and Australia was part of it. Melbourne University student Nicholas Coz in Florida awaiting the return of a scientific experiment which had been four years in the planning. 9.16 was the time we were supposed to hear the sonic boom and nothing came and then we had a phone call from someone that was connected with NASA and he said, listen, there's been some real bad news. They've lost mission control, has no contact, and we thought our house has dropped and we knew something was terribly wrong. Back in Melbourne, high school students who also contributed to the study were just as shocked. I turned on the television and I saw what was there and I just burst into tears. It was just absolutely devastating. Last month, the group were celebrating Columbia's launch. On board were eight specially bred spiders from Melbourne Zoo dispatched into space to see whether they could spin webs in zero gravity. Although everything we've gathered pales in light of what's happened today, we have gathered a lot of information. Damien Ryan, National 9 News.